for being here. And Mark, thank you for inviting You're me. Welcome. Um, this is a subject very close to my heart, and quite honestly, I never thought I'd be here talking at Harvard. <laughs> and what I've been doing for the last 20 years is empowering people, men and women, you're not left out, on how to build business and make money. Is anybody here interested in making money? Yes. Are some of you thinking about it? Okay. <laughs> so one of the things I found in anything we do, we need to do one thing first to be successful. And the one thing we need to do is make is see things from a different perspective. Because sometimes from where you're looking, you might miss things. So with that said, are you open to seeing things differently today? Yes? OK, yes. yes. I'm hard of hearing, so can I hear you say that again? Yes. 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 OK, awesome. So to get started, what I'd like to do is have everybody stand up and take everything with you and find a seat you've never sat in before, because you're probably sitting in a comfortable seat because it's where you feel familiar. You know, how many times are you in a position in your life where you want to move forward, but something makes you feel stuck? Just makes you feel stuck. You don't know what it is, but it might be as easy as just moving our seat. Because we'll see things from a different perspective. And what I'm going to share with you is how I actually found the secrets to my success was changing my perspective. So we're going to get started and do that. And what I want you to know, it all stems from knowing your purpose, knowing why you're doing anything you're doing. You know, why do you get up in the morning? Why do you want to make money? What is it going to serve? Because most of us think that our purpose is to go out there and be successful. Does anybody believe that? At least I was taught that. I went, that's what they taught me in school. Go out and be successful. But why do we need to be successful? Be helpful. What? Be helpful. Be helpful. Well, for some people to be helpful, my original purpose was not to go out and be successful to help others. I was told growing up I needed to be successful because if you made money, you arrived. See, they didn't say it was so I can serve other people. They said so I can serve myself. Interesting. So how many times are we doing something and our purpose is not the actual purpose that will drive you? So I spent the better part of my life really trying to fulfill a purpose that wasn't even my dream. My original purpose, I thought, when I, when I was young, I said, I want to serve others in a big way. And I thought, the best way to serve people, and this is funny that we're at Harvard, was to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to be, a teacher. Now, I grew up in a home where, I don't know about you, but I'm from a Jewish faith, Lisa Lieberman Wang. I'm the Lieberman <laughs> of the Wang, if you didn't figure that out. And my family told me when I said I wanted to be a teacher, they said, teachers don't make any money. So they said, I can't be a teacher. <laughs> I said, OK, so I'll be an attorney. And they said, no, you're going to go for your MRS degree. I got that twice, <laughs> my Mrs. degree. Oh, yeah. They said they weren't going to pay for the additional three years, never thinking at the time I could have paid for it myself. So I said, OK, my brother's going to be an accountant. I'll be an accountant. So I took two years of accounting and hated it. <laughs> hated it. Wasn't my thing. Definitely not my purpose. Changed it to marketing, advertising, minored in computers, and took every elective in business law I could find. Because I wanted to be an attorney. Because I was going to save the underdog. I was going to make a difference. That was my original purpose, serving and make a difference. But I didn't know that's what it was, because I was deep-rooted into some beliefs that were given to me, not by me. Do you know, by the time you're five years old, 55% of your beliefs are already formed by well-meaning guardians and parents. They already told you what to believe. So think about some of the beliefs you might have had growing up. Maybe you believe that you, know, you have to go to school and get a good education, especially if we're here, right? Maybe your belief was that you couldn't rely on other people. Maybe your belief was you should never trust somebody. But the truth is that there's no belief out there that can be proven. Because any belief you have has to be justified or explained to show it's true. So is it true? See, I know when I was growing up, they told me about the tooth fairy. Did anybody else hear about the tooth fairy? Yeah. I found out when I got older there wasn't one. It was my parents. <laughs> I was waiting for someone else to. I'm sorry, I didn't want to ruin it for you. But there wasn't a tooth fairy. And you know what? I thought about it. If they lied about that, what else did they lie about? Santa Claus, yeah, right. the Easter Bunny. And what's in the middle of the word beliefs? Lie. 
So how many things have you been telling yourself that maybe are a lie? How many things were told to you that maybe were a lie? Maybe you were told that you're not smart enough. Who told you that? Maybe it was a teacher that said to you in a class that you weren't smart enough. And then you went on your whole life and career thinking, I'm not smart enough. But at a 6.99999 billion people in the world, you listened to one person and you made that your belief that rooted your whole future. Think about some of the beliefs you've taken on. There's so many of them out there. You know, I'm going to talk to you about our tree of life. And the tree of life is all about the roots. This is your tree. Everybody has a tree. But the roots of the tree is based on our motivation, motive matters, why you do what you do, what the purpose is, what's driving you, the attitudes that you move forward with and the beliefs you carry that you want to fulfill. These are the roots. The values of the tree are things that you, that you feel are important, that you hold dear to yourself and that you live by. Those are your rules. They're usually also brought down by generations is how we develop them. Then you have your branches of your tree. The branches of the tree is what we do, is the actions you take to fulfill, to make the other things true. So someone who believes growing up is a belief that education is important, what would their behavior be is they'd go to school, right? That would be the branches. And from the branches, we get the fruits of our labor. And the fruits of our labor may be the success, the careers, the money, whatever it is for you, right? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about a young girl, and she happens to be one of my clients. And she was my first client. And when she came to me, some of her beliefs that she had when she was growing up was that she was never going to be skinny enough because her mother grew up being obese and always said to her, don't ever look like me. So her belief was she, her, she saw her mom always being ridiculed, having a hard time with flying. She needed an extra belt on the seat. You know, when you go to fly and you can't fit in the regular seat, her family always giving her a hard time. So she equated being fat as being not loved. So she was told, you never look like me. So her belief is I need to be skinny. She also believed that, you know, problems, you know, everything was about her. See, she grew up in a house a traditional dysfunctional family. You know any like that? Where everybody said a disparaging word. <laughs> so nobody was nice. Her nickname by her father was A.H. Asshole. She had a disease when she was growing up. She had turns to disease. Everything she touched turned to shit. What do you, kind of life do you think this girl grew up with? She didn't feel like she was good enough, couldn't do anything right, and her father wanted perfect children. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any perfect children, but she thought she needed to be perfect, so she did everything in her power to do that. So when her tree started growing, her trunk was all about her values, all about being skinny. And then you had to be successful, and you had to, you, had to, you had to be smart. And if you're smart and you do all these things, she's going to be loved. So she did everything in her power to do that. So she went to school, and she got good grades, and she was an honor student, and she got partial scholarships. I mean, everything you could ever imagine. But this big tree that looked so big and strong was actually really weak. Because through that, she found that in order to be perfect, she had to do everything and be everything for everyone, never please anyone, including herself. So she ended up getting sick. She ended up dealing with ulcers. It was while she was in college. And the doctor went home, told her to go home and said, what you, he, said when you, he said, just don't be stressed. Now, anybody here ever go to college? <laughs> We're in Harvard, right? Don't be stressed. Do you think there's a little stress in college? So she went home and listened to what the doctor said, but she was also interning with IBM at the time. She was teaching dance at Arthur Murray. She was pretty much stressed. So one day she's, she's with her dad, and her dad liked to ride his motorcycle, and he was very much about safety, so he put on the leather jacket on her, put on the helmet, and as she's getting on the back of his bike, she falls. 
and he realizes there's a problem. He rushes her to the hospital and finds she had a sudden heart attack. And as they're rushing her in on the gurney, he turns to her and says, I love you. And at that moment, it was the first time I ever heard my dad say, I love you. Because that story, that little girl was me. And there was a lesson learned and a belief formed at that moment that if you're sick, they're nice to you. It's a new belief. It became a new root. And because of that, I ended up staying sick for 13 years, was hospitalized five times over six months. I developed an eating disorder. I was about 30 pounds lighter than I am now. I was bulimic to the point where they didn't know what to do with bulimics back then, 30 years ago. So they ended up putting me in a psychiatric ward with people that had serious challenges that needed to be there. But they didn't know what it was. What they didn't know and what I never shared is that when I was 16 years old, because I had such a low self-esteem, I had put myself in a situation that I probably would never have put myself in today knowing, and I dated an older boy who took advantage of me. But this was a secret I kept, because my belief says I needed to be perfect. And if I wasn't, they wouldn't love me. Despite that, there was another belief that I had that was so strong, is I needed to be successful. Because if I wasn't successful, they wouldn't love me. So that was part of my purpose, was to be successful, my driven why. So I was, despite all that, I ended up starting my first business at 23. When I was working in corporate, I was one of the top salespeople in the world for MCI. I was a millionaire at 30. But I spent as much money trying to get well as I did that I made. So what is the price we pay based on the beliefs we tell ourselves, the things we do? So if your goal in life is just to make money, you might want to rethink your goal because it's so much more than the money. So what happened is, how do you get there? Like, how do you change this tree? What do you need to do to do it? And a lot of people say, you know, be positive. And I went to self-help groups, and I went to therapy, and I did all these things, and personal development, and you know, say, be happy, be positive, all these positive affirmations, right? They do nothing. They do nothing. The only way to, train, to change your tree is to cut it down is to cut it down, to become aware, to listen to what's being said. When somebody tells you something, try it on. And if it doesn't fit, don't wear it. You don't need to believe everything you're told. But how many people do? Look at the source. Your success is only contingent on your actions and your beliefs. You can cut it down. So cut down the things and plant some new seeds. And how do you get the new seeds? Really, start asking yourself better questions. Look at the stories you're telling yourself. Are you telling yourself stories of your life, of, of this drama and despair? Or are you telling yourself the story that makes you laugh and happy? Is it abundance or is it scarcity? You get to choose the story you tell. How many times have you gone to a bad movie? Have you gone to some bad movies? Yeah. Would you go back to see that movie again? <laughs> You sure? How many times have you told yourself the same story that's disempowering and you go back to that same movie over and over and over again? It's the same thing you're doing. So what if you actually took out the tape, changed the DVD, changed the channel, and no longer told yourself that story? That would be nice, right? And I know some people think, oh, it's not that easy. And I'm going to tell you something, you're wrong. The decisions we made took a moment to make them to shape our life, whether we were good or bad. The decision to change can take a moment in time to change it, to empower you to change everything. And that's the thing I did 20 years ago. I made a decision. And the decision was that I was no longer going to be the victim. And I wasn't okay with being a survivor. Because survivors just get by. 
I wanted to live. I wanted to be happy. And that was something no one taught me in school, nor did my parents know. There were well-meaning parents just teaching me what they learned before. It was just a progression of things. So you start changing your language. Instead of having problems, change the word to challenges. I remember I thought I had all the problems in the world. Anybody here think they have problems? Right? Look at someone who has no eyes, no legs, who can't hear. That's a problem, maybe. But some people have made that their assets. Look at people who have no homes. Just being able to be here, having a car, having a vehicle, having a roof over your head, you already have it better than most. Stop thinking you have problems. Start I decided I'd have challenges. And if someone called me with a problem, I'd say, call me back with a challenge. I can't fix problems, <laughs> but I can help you with a challenge. Right? Just changed my whole perspective on how I dealt with things. And then ask yourself better questions. Instead of asking yourself, why me, ask yourself, why not me? One of my favorite questions I ask all the time when I'm in situations is, what's good about this? Because I know looking at what happened to me 30 years ago, I would never have saw myself, I would never have seen anything good about that. There was no way to see anything good about that. But today, had all those things not happened to me, I would not be serving the world at the purpose I am today. Because my mission today is to help empower women to create inner peace and power. And for us no longer to be victims, but to break through the barriers that weigh them down. And I deal with so many successful women on the outside. It looks like their tree's OK, but on the inside, it's dying. And you know what? It's not OK. It's not OK. So ask better questions. And this is my new tree. And when I planted this tree, I've had 20 years of abstinence. That's from hurting myself, from binging and purging and doing all the other stuff. And it was only a couple of years ago that I decided to pr my purpose was to share this and help others. I call up my mom. I said, you know, Ma, I decided I'm actually going to help other people. And I'm going to work with women with depression, disordered eating, and self-sabotage. And she says to me, oh, you're finally coming out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I didn't know I was in the closet, Mom, but thanks for sharing. <laughs> I said, OK, I'm coming out of the closet. But I knew that if I can just make the change of one person, I'd be changing everything. But my mission is bigger than me. My mission is to touch more lives than Oprah. Wow. And the only way I'm going to do that is not by me, myself, but by helping other people who find the tools and use the tools to help other people. Because I don't need to do this. I just need to help another people live their true purpose and take care of themselves and help other people do the same. And when I did that, I changed my attitudes. Instead of being conditional love about needing to do things to be loved, I was already loved. And I had to love myself first. I also changed it to empowering other people. But my biggest one is give back to the world the gifts that God has already given to me, which presupposes I've already had the gifts. I don't need to do anything to be loved. And with that, my whole thing with my values is integrity, love, nurturing, caring. The branches I've built has been huge that's given me the privilege and the honor to be on national TV, to help other people, to work with women that totally want to make a difference. So you get to plant a seed. It's your choice. You have two seeds. You get to choose which one are you planting, and what does your tree look like? This is your choice. I'd like to offer a gift to anybody who'd like it for being here. Um, if you'd like to be able to have a free group session with me, for anybody here, if you just text the keyword "find to fab that's find to fab and it is the name of the book as well, to Lisa Lieberman, excuse me, to 90210, we, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and we'll have a free session online. I actually get $500 an hour to speak with someone, so you have an idea of what my time is worth. And I always say, I have invested over half a million dollars in my education to get well after my college education. I'm not asking anybody to ever pay for it. What I want you to do is value your health and value your wellness, because we don't realize how much it costs to be sick. And you can find my book on Amazon. It was a number one bestseller. Um, what I'd like to do is just finish by telling you what Fine to Fab stands for. Is that OK? For years, everybody said, how are you doing? How are you doing? And I used to say, fine. And they finally said, how are you doing? I'd say, fine. 
And they say, well, how are you doing, really? I go, fine. And I'd say, I'm effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. I'm fine. <laughs> and I finally realized one day I wanted to be fab. And I wanted to be fabulous, awesome, beautiful. So fine to fab is about taking yourself from a journey from not being where you want to be to being where you want to be. So I wish you all a fab day. And know you already fab, fabulous, awesome, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.